We're not setting any dates, but we know that the time is near. We know that the veil is being lifted. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, and Jews in Israel are being saved like never before. There is a revival in Israel. There is a hunger in Israel. We give all the glory to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Yeshua. The time that Amos prophesied, we are living that time right now, almost. Amos chapter 8, verse 11, the days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food, or a thirst of water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. We are living in those times right now, as sin is exhalating to a new level, as we see the demonic outpouring all over the world, the gospels going forth, and people are searching for the truth. And we know that the truth can only do one thing, and that is set you free. We're having many, many follow-ups. Many people are calling us and contacting the ministry. Several months ago, a Jew by the name of Chaim Ravivo met me at the Wailing Wall, the Kotel area. I was sharing the gospel with Chaim. He took contact information and said that he'll call the ministry soon. Months passed and he did not contact. Recently, Chaim contacted the ministry and said, I want to meet. I can't sleep at night. The Bible verses are driving me crazy. I don't have answers. Can we meet? Praise Yeshua. In the midst of the demonic outpouring in the midst of sin exhalating to a new level, Orthodox Jews are calling the ministry and searching for truth. We give all the glory to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Yeshua. I scheduled a meeting with Chaim in Talpiot, Jerusalem, the area where he lives. Two days before the meeting, Chaim called and said, can we change the meeting to the Kotel area? It might be too dangerous here. In the Kotel area, there are more people. Praise Yeshua. I met Chaim right at the Kotel area. As the team were praying, I began to share with Chaim and answer his questions. I met Chaim in the Kotel area. We shook hands. He was very happy. Chaim said, I have a question about Isaiah 53. I can't sleep at night. I told Chaim, the fact that you can't sleep at night is called the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the power of the Holy Spirit. I then asked Chaim, what part of Isaiah 53 is your question. He said the first three verses. I then opened Isaiah 53 and read Isaiah 53 verses 1 to 3. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one who people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. I said, where is your question? This is speaking about the Messiah, Mashiach. He said, I know. It says here, who has believed our message? What does it mean, our message? That's plural. Praise Yeshua. The power of the Holy Spirit was working. The prayers of the believers in the background were working. I told him because Yeshua is God and because he's God in the flesh where it says who has believed our message it's talking about the Father Son and Holy Spirit because Yeshua and the Father are one who has believed our message time turned to me and asked yes but where in the Bible can you show me that Yeshua and God are one in a tangible way I told Chaim, I'm glad you asked the questions you have are the questions I had before I believed in Yeshua. I asked Chaim, who sent down fire and brimstone from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah? He said, God. I said, can someone else send it? He said, no, only God did it. I said, let's read Genesis 19, verse 24. Before I read this, I asked Chaim another question. Let's say there are two Moshes, two men named Moshe. One Moshe is standing on a ladder. The other Moshe is standing on the ground. And Moshe asked the Moshe on the ground, can you give me a hammer? How many Moshes are there? He said, there are two. I said, let's read now. Genesis 19, verse 24. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. How many lords are there here? He said, let me read that again. He read it again in Hebrew. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire 
from, in Hebrew, me Yehovah, out of heaven. From the Lord, out of heaven. He was in complete shock. He said, how can this be? There's only one Lord. I said, yes, there is only one Lord. That's why Yeshua and the Father are one. That's why it says in Isaiah 53, who has believed our message? There's only one Lord. There's only one God. There's only one truth. There's only one Messiah. And when it says here, from the Lord out of heaven, it's showing you that Yeshua and the Father are one. It's showing you what it says in Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? It's showing you what it says in Psalms 2. Let's open Psalms 2, verse 12, and read together. If the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And we can see right here that God is telling us to kiss the Son. It's a form of worship because the Father and the Son are one. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. No one makes it to the Father, but only through Yeshua HaMashiach, who has believed our message. Isaiah 53, the Lord reigned fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. Once again, we see the plurality. We see that the Father and the Son are one because the Father will never tell you to do something that contradicts scripture. Just like it says in the Ten Commandments, it says you shall not have other gods. If he's telling you in Psalms 2 verse 12, to worship the Son, it cannot contradict Scripture because they're one God. Therefore, who has believed our message? The Lord rained brimstone from heaven from the Lord. Kiss the Son, lest you perish. You must do all through Him. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. And so you can see here, Chaim, that there's no confusion. It's very clear. Chaim looked at me and says, Anitali, Anitali, you've answered my question. And he began, he began to say something supernatural. He began to say, Ani Mukhan, I'm ready. This was a supernatural event. Chaim was ready to accept Messiah Yeshua right there in the Kotel area. This man that was fearful to meet in Tarpiod because of his neighbors, because of people, was now in the public area of the Kotel area. He forgot where he was. The power of the Ruach HaKodesh was working. The power of the believers that were praying was working. All glory goes to Yeshua. And he began to say, Ani Mukhan, I'm ready to accept. What do I need to do? Call on the name of Yeshua. Repent. Believe that he died on the tree on the cross for your sins. That he rose on the third day. And if you believe that he is the Mashiach, if you believe that he's the Messiah, if you believe that he's God, if you believe that he's the one in Isaiah 53 that said, who has believed our message, you call on him as Lord and Savior, you will be saved. Praise Yeshua. Right there in the Kotel area, Chaim called on the name of Yeshua, Jesus, as his personal Savior. He prayed together with me. We hugged each other, and he is now a believer in Yeshua. We give all the glory to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Yeshua. He then asked, but what shall I do? I'm still in the synagogue. I said, you are now a new believer in Yeshua. When you're ready, we'll put you in one of our house groups. You'll study the word of God. It's going to take time until you get out of all the rabbinic books and everything and study only the word of God in context. The Holy Spirit will guide you what is necessary to do. Time then asked me, Animi Bulbar, I'm a little bit confused. Do I need to get Litaber, Litaber? Do I need to get uh, Mikvat? Do I need to go to the... He, he, he was referring to baptism. I said, Chaim, all in time when you're ready, when you understand everything. Slowly, slowly. You're now a new believer in Yeshua. You'll have brothers together with you. We'll study the Word of God together. Praise Yeshua. Chaim was very, very excited. He will join one of our house groups, one of our discipleship training programs. And we continue to pray as he continues to grow in his faith. And we pray that he'll bring more people into salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Supernatural event. An Orthodox Jew saved at the Kotel area. We pray that Chaim will be able to stand firm in his faith as now he's going to preach the gospel to his wife and family. We will continue to preach the gospel no matter what. Achikol Israel Ivasha. Until all Israel shall be saved.
again, a lot of you are familiar with the, the two powers stuff uh, that I do and talk about, especially again if you've read the book. But for those who are not, of course, you have the Shema, very familiar uh, creedal statement from Judaism, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. <clears throat> this is, I, I bring this up because how could a Jew affirm that and then write this? No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side. <laughs> okay. How do you pull that off? He has made him known. Now, you know, John is a Jew. He knows the Shema. What in the world is going on here? Uh, at one time in, in Judaism, Judaism used to affirm something that they used to uh, talk about positively as the two powers in heaven idea. This is not dualism, one good guy, one bad guy, of equal weight. Okay, it's not uh, you know, Marvel Comics or anything like that. These were two good guys, okay, two powers in heaven. And that idea falls into ill repute, disrepute, at around the second century. Again, not coincidentally the time, you know, when we have the advent of Christianity and a few other things going on. But Judaism at one point in its history essentially had a Godhead teaching. And they get it from their Old Testament. So when you have a, a Jew like John who writes this, of course, knowing the Shema, he, he's not thinking when he's writing this, oh, <clears throat> this is good. I get to deny my faith in the God of Israel now. Okay, he's not thinking that at all. So he's sort of the exemplar for just the average question, even for Jewish converts in the book of Acts or whatever. You know, how is it that, that these people, Jews, who refused even on pain of death to worship another god, how could they at the same time turn around and embrace Jesus as God in the flesh, worship him, sing praises to him, Again, talk about him the way they do. How, how could they do that and not feel like they were violating the formative creedal statement of the Old Testament? How does that work? And it, it's a big deal. I mean, it's still a big deal for, for Jews I've met. Um, again, we're going to go through this real quickly. But there's, there's a whole rabbinic discussion about the two powers prior to the second century. And... Just an example of one verse. The, the, the rabbis would, would pick up on, on different verses that they knew, looking at it, was a little bit odd. There was something odd in them. Genesis 19:24. this is the Sodom and Gomorrah story, which I'm sure all of you have read. But you look at this, and what's odd about it? You tell me. Yeah, it sounds like there's two Yahwehs. You know, Yahweh raining fire upon Sodom and Gomorrah, or, you know, sulfurous fire. And, and that sulfur, sulfurous fire happens to be from Yahweh. So how can Yahweh, you know, send this sulfurous fire from Yahweh? Just, it, it, just, it was just odd. And, you know, rabbis would, would notice these things and discuss them. Again, the major book on this, if you're interested, is still in print. It was printed in 1977, The Two Powers in Heaven, by Alan Siegel. Siegel uh, passed away a few years ago. He was a Jew, Jewish scholar, rabbinic scholar, and his book is about the history of this idea in Judaism. He goes through all the rabbinic material, uh, again, establishing the fact that, yep, we used to teach this. <laughs> and boy, it's, a, it's heretical, isn't it? You know, I mean, because he, he was a Jew. He, he doesn't want to go along with it, but his book is just about, yeah, this used to be part of our theology. Get until the second century AD. Other passages, Daniel, again, you have the Ancient of Days seated, and then you have, you know, the description, which is, you know, all familiar to us, hair like lamb's wool, thrown in tongues of flame, just like Ezekiel 1. I mean, we know who this is, the wheels, the whole bit. And then the court sat, again, divine council meeting, the books were open, one like a human being, you know, one like a son of man, a human one, came with the clouds of heaven, dominion, glory, and kingship were given to him. There's something else about this passage that I don't have in red. I don't even know if you can see the color there. 
this whole motif of the coming upon the clouds, okay, which I'm not going to get into specifically here. I'll get into some other two power stuff, but I'll mention this this much. In the ancient Near Eastern world, the epithet, the one who comes with the clouds or the one who comes upon the clouds or the one who rides the chariot in the clouds, something like that, that was a known epithet for Baal. Okay, Baal is not an underling. He's not just an angel. Okay, I'm saying this for like Jehovah's Witnesses because Jehovah's Witnesses like to take deity language used of Jesus and say, oh, he's just an angel and a created being and all this kind of stuff. Well, the coming on the upon, uh, upon the clouds thing is a big deal because of the way it gets used in the New Testament when Jesus is on trial because it goes back to Daniel 7. But anyway, you, you get this well-known deity phrase. The Old Testament writers use this deity phrase that everybody, Jew or outside of Judaism, you know, whether you're Israelite or not, they know what, what this is because Baal was such a big deal in the ancient world. Baal was worshipped even in the Roman period. Okay? He's, he's, he's just a big figure. And the biblical writers in the Old Testament use the phrase four times of Yahweh of Israel. And the reason was Baal was a, was a storm god. He's, he was the god that was perceived as giving us rain, you know, Baal's a wonderful guy because he gives us rain. And that means our crops grow. That means we get to eat. You know, it means our, our animals get to eat. We're alive because Baal sends us rain and we can survive and always oh, wonderful. Okay? Well, the biblical writers are like, no, 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 no. Baal isn't the one who controls this stuff. It's Yahweh of Israel. So they would take this label and stick it on Yahweh, you know, to, to make this theological point. Well, the only place they don't do that, there's one other occurrence and it's Daniel 7. Here it's applied to a second figure, aside from the God of Israel. And so Jesus knows this. I mean, he, the Jews knew it. This was one of, their, one of the, the, the primary texts in Judaism for, to reinforce this, the two powers in heaven teaching was this one right here, Daniel 7. So when Jesus is on trial in front of Caiaphas, and Caiaphas says, come on, tell us who you are. You know, quit beating around the bush. And he says, okay. Okay, now listen up, Caiaphas. You know, I don't want you to miss this. So hereafter you will see the Son of Man coming upon the clouds, you know, in great glory. Okay, that, you want to know who I am? I'm the guy in Daniel 7 who's the cloud rider. And Caiaphas tears his clothes, says this is blasphemy. He knows instantly what Jesus is saying. And every Jew would have. Because they have this two powers thing. There's, there's Yahweh, but then there's like this other Yahweh.